Okay. Let's Okay, folks, I like to usually start these on time, and um, but we will happily let in other folks uh, as they arrive. Uh, welcome to uh, Fall Prairie Skies, which we have moved to virtually this fall from the Starkle Planetarium at Parkland College. Uh, maybe some of you have joined us in person here. Um, others might just be interested in seeing what we have to offer. Either way, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, what I'm trying to do this evening over the next 30 minutes or so is to just give you a little bit of a tour of what you can see in the night sky tonight, a lot of the brighter objects. And, and we'll always have time for you to ask any questions uh, you have. So you can ask those in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand or something and we will happily let you uh, use your microphones to ask that question as well. Um, so we could even take some requests at the end too. So feel free to uh, think of some things in mind uh, while you do that. Um, with me here tonight is Waylena McCulley. Uh, I'm the director of the Starkle Planetarium, Eric Johnson, you see my name's there. Um, I should actually now spotlight Waylena because I already said her name in a moment. There we go, let's uh, put that there. There's Waylena, okay, so she's waving. Uh, she's our show producer. We are in separate locations. That is why we have our masks off. Isn't that nice and safe of us? Um, anyways, um, but we do spend plenty of time uh, over at the planetarium doing all sorts of fun things. Uh, let me go ahead and let those folks in there. Perfect. Now, uh, regarding the Starco Planetarium, here's what I'm going to do for you all now. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what I'm looking at. Uh, we have this lovely piece of sky simulation software called Stellarium. Uh, it is open source. Uh, it's a software that you can download and install on your computers at home. And it works on nearly every computer without much, uh, much problem. Um, and they've been working on this for many years. So even older computers can download older versions of the software to work for them. Um, now, with the software, notice that we're using it to just look at the planetarium's facade. Isn't that cool? Um, I can scroll around here and look uh, at our local uh, theater uh, building right there. And just up there, we can also see the sun, okay? So at this moment, this is what the sky would have looked like today if it were clear skies at a little bit after noon. Uh, you're seeing the sun in the southern sky right here, okay? Uh, when the sun is as high as possible. You've heard of high noon, right? Yeah, that's coming from the sun being as high as possible. Uh, long before people had reliable watches or they looked to their smartphones to tell them what time it was, we would use the sun to tell time, okay? So let's go ahead and go a little bit later into the afternoon here. We'll let the sun scroll across the sky right there. Scroll, oh my gosh. Um, so let's let the sun scroll a uh, move across the sky there. You see it's getting lower. You even see how the, uh, the color of the sky has changed. Um, and that's because since the sun is passing through a thicker atmosphere because of the angle of the sunlight, um, the way that the sunlight gets scattered through our atmosphere changes uh, what we see overhead, all right? Um, and so the sun is gonna set over here in the west, a little bit south of west because it is in the fall. Um, but I no longer can see the sun now. So before that sun is going to set, I'm going to make one other change to our settings here. I'm going to open up our uh, one of our configuration settings, our landscapes that we have here. I'm going to go to CUAS Observatory. Um, we're in East Central Illinois, and the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society is a group of amateur astronomers that operate in the area and they have an observatory just outside of Champaign. You can see now the sun is right there unencumbered because it's out in the farmland. Um, and if you're curious about what the observatory looks like, well, there it is right there. Uh, you can see they've got a building that has a roof that rolls off onto those piers right there. Um, and there are telescopes mounted inside of there along with the telescopes in that dome there. So even, um, even if we're not open for public viewings where we can share our telescopes with everybody, what's really nice about that is that we can at least uh, go out there and just 
look at the night sky because out here it's actually dark enough, it's away enough from enough of the uh, light pollution that you can see the Milky Way from this site. And tonight, uh, tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, tonight after the sun sets, uh, which I believe it already has, uh, you should have no trouble seeing the Milky Way out there. Okay, so let's go ahead and watch that sunset now. There we go. Twilight's starting to leave and you're not seeing anything, but there are now a bunch of stars. Now, these are the stars that you would see over in the west and in the southwestern sky. Um, I've enhanced some of the settings to make sure that they translate pretty well over our Zoom live stream here. Um, so you might see them looking a lot brighter than you would in real life, but at least it looks really nice. Uh, another feature that you're seeing that I've enhanced a little bit as well, if you look really closely at those stars, you might see them twinkling a little bit, all right? You see that flickering brightness? Since these stars are trillions of miles away from us, um, that light as it passes through our atmosphere can get heavily distorted, and that's what will make them flicker in brightness and sometimes even in color as well. And that's what you're seeing right here. Um, the brighter the star, the easier this is to see. And if it's also lower to the horizon, it's uh, another enhanced effect. So I was out at this observatory um, a couple of nights ago, and I saw a lot of this twinkling going on with a couple of these stars right here. Um, the brightest ones that I see here, uh, there's this one right here, whose name is Arcturus. And this one over here, whose name is Antares, those are two really nice examples of twinkling stars that you can see in the, uh, in this, in the western and southwestern skies. Now, uh, I'm gonna give you some other hints for knowing the names of those stars because I already shared them with you, but I wanna look to the north because there's a star that a lot of you probably know over in that part of the sky. So let's go ahead and do that there. All right, now, in case you don't believe me that I'm looking in the north, let me go ahead and I'm gonna turn on my cardinal directions here. There you go. You see, we are facing towards the north right now. Okay. Um, now, when looking in this part of the sky, you might recognize a couple of uh, star shapes, star patterns, if you will, uh, that look pretty familiar to you. If you're not sure, I can go ahead and draw them out here for you. So let me do some annotations. So I've connected the dots of three stars, four, five, six, seven stars. You probably know that group of stars as the Big Dipper. Yeah, exactly. Um, in North America, we call that the Big Dipper, but in other cultures, they give it different names. And I'm not just talking about cultures um, that don't speak English here. If you ask anybody in Great Britain or in Ireland, they'll actually refer to it as the Starry Plow. You'll often hear it referred to as a wagon as well. Can you see a wagon when you look at those stars? In the planetarium, we actually have a picture where we make it look like a shopping cart. Um, and I, I like to imagine it like that too. Um, but feel free to imagine however you think it looks. Um, another really neat thing about Stellarium is that you can explore some other cultures. If you go to Star Lore right here, you don't have to just stick with the Western names of the stars. You can look at how, what the Navajo call those stars or Norse cultures. Um, or you can check to see what the Tongans, people out in Polynesia, what they might call it. All sorts of options happen to be available for your perusal, okay? So let's see here. I was talking about the Big Dipper. Notice that when I connect the dots here in the software, we see a lot more than seven stars right there. That's because when you asked the Romans, they referred to this as Ursa Major, which means Big Bear right there, okay? So you're seeing the big bear. And what's really useful to us is that if you take these two stars of Ursa Major right there away from the handle of the Big Dipper and you draw a line with them, I was talking about lines before, I should draw a line again, here we go. I draw a line with those two stars. It takes us very close to a bright star up there in the sky, about 40 degrees up, that star is called Polaris. Whoops, let me actually show you that. There you go. It's Polaris right there, okay? And Polaris 
every single night you look at it, you will find it almost exactly due north. All right. And even if we were to go later into the night, look at that. You see Polaris looks like it's basically stationary right there. OK, let me go back an hour here. Um, and Polaris, you'll notice, is actually in a constellation known as Ursa Minor. But it's not just known as the little bear right there. Um, a lot of people see how that shape of seven stars looks so similar to the Big Dipper we just talked about. And they usually imagine that they call it the Little Dipper. OK, so we have the Big Dipper here and Polaris is at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. Now, um, I wanted to show you a really nice way to remember the name Arcturus. Uh, you see Arcturus is back over here in the west. I was telling you about that before. It's in the constellation Boötes, but I'm not going to deal with that right now. Um, so Arcturus is right there. And a really nice way to remember the name Arcturus, we have our Big Dipper over to the right side here. Notice the handle of the Big Dipper is kind of curved, kind of like a circular arc. So we like to tell people to follow the arc to Arcturus. A really useful mnemonic device, okay? And we've got a good mnemonic device for that star Antares I was telling you about before here too, okay? Antares is right here. Now Antares happens to lie along a line that we call the ecliptic. Um, the ecliptic is the line that the sun makes throughout the year. And the ecliptic uh, happens to pass through all of the constellations of the zodiac. And this is also where you find all the planets as well. They're not exactly on the ecliptic all the time, but they're close to it. Um, and I'll talk to about a couple planets here in a few seconds. Um, but one planet in particular that happens to go by the star Antares about every two years is Mars. Now Mars is the red planet. And you can see how the red planet would be compared to this reddish star that you see right here, Antares, okay? You could almost potentially even mix them up. One good way to tell them apart is that since the planets are so much closer to us, they twinkle a lot less. Before I continue with my explanation, look at the sky up here. Do you see anything really bright up there that's not twinkling? Yeah, those are stars right there, okay? And that's those, yeah, wow. Those are stars that are twinkling. I'm making a lot of mistakes tonight. Um, this objects that are not twinkling are the planets, okay? And we will hit those planets up next here in just a second. So basically, Antares got its name from being potentially mistaken for Mars. You know that Mars is the Roman god of war. The Greek equivalent is Ares. So that name Antares that you see there means literally not Mars. That's what we're getting at right there, okay? Yeah, and Terry's means not Mars. All right, so I've been talking about planets and I wanna actually bring them up for you. As I said, the planets are along the ecliptic and you can see them up here as well. Did I turn off the, yeah, I did turn off the Milky Way. Wow, sorry about that, folks. I don't, know, don't remember why I did that. That must have happened uh, while I was setting up. Yeah, the Milky Way is up. I should have shown that to you, um, so. Yeah, you see these things don't run perfectly, do they? Um, but just to the left of this neat group of stars right here, which here, I'll draw it out for you so you can see what I'm seeing with this. This group of stars here, notice that, oops, notice that you see it kind of looks like a teapot. And so we call that group of stars right there the teapot. And a really fun thing about the teapot is that you know that when the water is boiling in that teapot, you're gonna see steam rising out of that teapot. And I love to see that in the night sky because it tells me that if I can see the teapot, I know exactly where to look for the Milky Way because the Milky Way is that steam right there. All right. I found another way to distract myself away from looking at the planets. Let's go ahead and get back to those once again. Let's hit this really bright one right here. I don't wanna give it away, so I'm going to uh, click on it. Sorry about that. I'm going to click on it. You already saw the name there. I was trying to turn off the ecliptic, excuse me. Lots of stumbling blocks tonight, that's all right. We're going to center on this and we're going to zoom in real close so that you get a good, nice view of this planet. It's almost as if you turned it in and put it in a telescope. So notice that when we get close here, you see four objects just to the left in a nice line right there. Next to this planet are its four largest moons. 
if I get in really close, there we go, you can see that this planet has some really nice bands of color on it. It's a really colorful planet. And we actually are not totally certain about why this planet has such color to it, because you're looking at clouds right there, okay? These are clouds of the largest of all the planets in our solar system. As you saw already a minute ago, you're looking at Jupiter right here. Jupiter is a humongous planet. Do you see that big red dot right there? I know I'm not using the technical name for it. The technical name for it is the Great Red Spot. Yeah, that's the technical name for it. That right there, if the rest of what you see on Jupiter is clouds, that makes the Great Red Spot a hurricane. And that hurricane is larger than our entire planet. Yeah, Jupiter's so big, it has a storm bigger than Earth. It's just wild to think about, okay? Basically inconceivable, honestly. But that's what you're looking at with Jupiter right there. And then next to Jupiter, these four dots here are Jupiter's largest moons. Galileo saw these moons in his telescope over 400 years ago, and we've been tracking them ever since. Okay, um, their names are Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede right there. Okay, um, and they're all pretty big. Uh, all of them are about the size of the moon or bigger. In fact, one of them is actually even bigger than a planet, Mercury. Okay, pretty cool to think about that. Let's zoom Eric, back out. Eric, yeah. before, you, uh, before you leave the subject of Jupiter completely, we do have a question. Oh, Barbara sure. asks, is the hurricane always occurring? That is a fantastic question, Barbara. Thank you for asking that. Um, there is the great red spot has been seen on Jupiter for over 100 years. Okay. I don't remember the exact date it was originally observed. I used to say that it's been seen since the 1600s, but now from what I've heard, I don't know if that there's reliable evidence tracking it back that far. Nevertheless, we have seen that thing constantly on Jupiter for over 100 years. Those other storms that you saw on Jupiter there from that image, those other storms have been quite persistent as well. Um, these other little storms that you see here, we have observed them for a few decades too. Okay, pretty wild. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for the for asking that. Yeah, Jupiter's got some very, very persistent storms. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I get so wrapped up in what I'm doing on Stellarium, so I don't uh, catch all of those questions. So thanks for bringing that up. All right, let's do our next planet just to the left of it. And I think I'm not going to give it away just by clicking on this. Yes, good. Let's zoom in on it. Let's zoom in on it. All right. Uh, there's a couple of moons that you're seeing right there. Ooh, I bet you folks now know exactly which planet this is. It's unmistakable when you see those humongous rings, you are looking at the planet Saturn right here. Let me tell you folks, if you look at Saturn through a telescope, it's going to look a lot like what you see right there. Okay, that's how you're going to see it. Uh, the moons are probably a little bit brighter than usual, but you will still see a circle with an oval around it like that. Okay, Galileo saw rings, and since he had never had the concept of planets having rings before, it was very confusing to him. But we now have a much better understanding of what we're looking at when we look at the rings of Saturn. We now understand that these are not like solid ribbons uh, winding their way uh, thousands of miles away from this planet you're actually looking at countless um, bits of ice, uh, a little bit colored uh, by dust and by little bits of organic material, um, but it's ice. And ice is really reflective. You know, have you ever been blinded in a, in, by snow on a sunny day? Um, that can happen right there. And that ice reflects its light very nicely back in our direction. So that's something you can see when you look at Saturn through a telescope, and not even that big of a telescope either, okay? Uh, all those little dots around Saturn, those are some of Saturn's many, many moons. Both Jupiter and Saturn actually have dozens of known moons. Both of them have about 80 moons uh, each, honestly. Um, but uh, there could be many more that have not been found yet. Now, going back to Barbara's question, I actually wanna give a follow-up answer there. Saturn is another gas giant planet. So the stripes that you're seeing there on this planet, 
Those are cloud layers, just like what we saw with Jupiter. Um, but Saturn's not nearly as colorful as Jupiter is. Um, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, for one thing, Saturn's um, got a lot less mass than Jupiter does. So the clouds are a little bit more spread out. Saturn's much less dense. Um, and because of that reason, and since Saturn's so much farther from the sun, uh, if Saturn forms storms, they're not as persistent as they are on Jupiter. We don't see storms lasting for decades like we do with Jupiter. Okay, go back all the way here. There we go. All right. Now, um, if you folks are looking in the night sky tonight, you will see Jupiter and Saturn uh, in the southern sky. Jupiter will probably be the first thing you catch, and then Saturn will be a little bit dimmer than that, but you should be able to notice it if the skies are clear around where you live. Um, that said, though, uh, there's going to be another really nice object you will see coming up tonight as well. And I'm going to go over there right now. If you look over in the east, low over to the sky, you can see something pretty bright there. And notice that it's not twinkling the way that the stars are. And you can see also it's got that kind of reddish color. We were talking about that reddish color when we talked about the star Antares, right? And Antares was not Mars. Well, that's what we're looking at here. This is Mars. All right, here, there you go. This is Mars. Let's go ahead and zoom in on Mars now. Now, Mars is really bright right now because Mars is very, very close to Earth. Uh, if you look at the distance there listed on the upper left, it's telling you that Mars is about 62 million kilometers away from us. Um, that translates to those of you who favor miles to about 40 million miles. But I got to tell you, 40 million miles is something I don't really conceive of. Have you ever had a car that's even gone a million miles? Yeah, exactly. So it's really far away. Um, but nevertheless, this is as close as Mars gets to us usually about every two years. And in fact, Mars is so close to us right now, uh, it won't get this close again until uh, 15 years from now, until the year 2035. So it's going to be a while. Um, and when you look at Mars through a nice high powered telescope, you can see some interesting features on the surface. Um, I've been able to see polar ice caps on Mars. Um, you might not get the details you get in this photograph, but I've seen some really nice pictures from ground-based telescopes on Earth. All right. So you can see in this image here, I think there's a little bit of white down there at the bottom. That's probably one of the polar regions. I see what looks like probably an extinct volcano up there at the top. At other times of the night, you can see other cool features, crater basins. Uh, sometimes you can see, uh, you can see if you look at this image of Mars, you could see maybe canyons as well. Um, all sorts of cool stuff with Mars. Um, but I'm not going to get into all those great details. Mars is pretty similar to Earth in uh, many ways. Mars is obviously a rocky world, and there are signs of erosion. I was telling you about canyons, right? So Mars used to be covered in actually liquid water, all right? Pretty cool to think about there. And that's why we keep sending spacecraft to that planet. Perhaps you heard about the Mars 2020 mission that launched from Earth back in July. It's going to get to Mars in February, and we'll do uh, a, an event uh, to, uh, to commemorate that landing at that time as well. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. A really nice thing about that landing is that uh, in addition to another rover being put on the surface, that rover is going to deploy a helicopter to fly over the surface. Okay, And that's going to be a lot of fun to see what that can uh, show us about this planet. All right. Um, Let's see here. I'm going to show you a couple of other really bright stars. Um, and they are up at this moment. I think the time right now is not even 8 o'clock on here. Um, but we need to kind of look up. We're going to move our sky up here so that we're looking almost straight overhead. Notice that you can see the Milky Way once again. And if you want to track what we were just doing, if you go up from the south, follow the Milky Way up overhead, this is exactly where I want to position this. Um, and while you see a whole ton of stars up there in the sky, almost directly overhead, um, 
even if you're in an area with a lot of light pollution, like maybe you step outside your house right now and look in your backyard, if you look directly overhead, you should see at least three pretty bright stars, okay? And those three bright stars are named Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Um, and those are the three stars of what we call the Summer Triangle. Um, a good way to help you remember the names of those stars, Deneb starts with a D, Altair starts with an A, and Vega starts with a VE. So if you want to be a little silly about it, if you have a friend named Dave, and you know a lot of us do because it's a pretty common name, you can point out those three stars to him and say, hey, there's the Dave triangle. That's your triangle right there, if you want. Okay. Um, now that said, these three uh, stars are actually in different constellations, even though they're part of the summer triangle. Deneb up here happens to be part of this group of stars right there. Use your imagination right now. Tell me what you kind of see with this. Maybe you see an airplane. Maybe you see a cross shape in that. Um, and yeah, people see that as the Northern Cross right there. Um, or apparently, Waylene, I saw her flapping her arms around. Maybe she was thinking of those wacky, waving, inflatable arm flailing tube men that you see outside of car dealerships. Perfectly reasonable possibility right there. And notice that I was able to get that whole phrase correctly. I did not slip my tongue at all with that. Wacky, waving, inflatable arm flailing tube man. Yes, thank you. I did deserve that a round of applause. All right. Um, this constellation, the way that the Greeks and the Romans saw it, they saw a swan. That swan's name was Cygnus. Cygnus is the Latin word for swan right there. So Deneb got its name from being the tail of the swan right there. Okay. Uh, let's go down to Altair. Altair is actually going to be another bird. And let me turn that off too. And let's click on it and find out what it looks like. Get those lines back up there. Uh, the way that the dots are connected here, Altair I see as the head. And then I see a wing here and a wing here and a tail. Like I said, it's another bird. If you want to imagine it as a person who's just trying to do the Y and YMCA, that's perfectly all right. Okay, you're welcome to imagine that. Um, the Greeks, they saw it as an eagle. And the eagle's name in Latin is Aquila. Okay, so there's Altair with a, in the constellation of Aquila. All right, let's do the last one now. Ah, the signal's lagging. That's too bad. I'm sorry that I can't get my stream to run perfectly here, but thank you for letting us know. Um, we are recording this as well, and I believe Waylene has been starting to post these videos up onto our YouTube channel as well, and hopefully the uh, quality of that feed's going to be even better. All right, let's go now to Vega. Oops, that kind of gives it away right there, but then again, you folks might not know what Lyra means. Um, with Vega right there, if you look at it, it kind of looks like maybe a little necktie or a fish. Um, but what you're seeing with the constellation of Lyra is it looks like a harp. But it's one of those smaller harps, like what you hold in your hand. Okay. And the term that we give for that is a lyre, L Y R E. Okay. Um, maybe if you watched Looney Tunes cartoons, whenever you saw one of the angels, they would be playing that lyre as they floated up into the heavens. Okay, that's this instrument right here. For those of you who know a little bit more about Greek mythology, maybe you know about the tale of Orpheus going into the underworld. Well, that's his instrument right there. So when people would tell stories about Orpheus, they would point at that group of stars in the sky. All right. Ah, there you see a bunch of examples of the constellations we've gone over here. Ah, and a couple that I haven't gone over. You're seeing the two fish Pisces right there because Mars is in Pisces at this moment. All right. Let me turn off all of those and that as well. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to go a little bit later into the night and we'll watch and see how the stars are changing here. Ah, oh, looks like I've got my star labels on still. Yeah, that's the star capella right there. Um, a couple hours into the night, um, let me pause it right here. This is a good stopping point. Uh, this is at about 11 p.m. So Mars has gotten pretty high up, but it's still over in the southeast. But to the left of Mars and above this sideways V shape right there, there's an interesting group of stars that you can see right there. Let me give you a closer look at this one. There we go. When some people look at this one, 
through a set of binoculars, they often see it looking kind of like a tiny little dipper. Some people mistake it for calling it the little dipper, but um, I've heard also some people jokingly call it the micro dipper. That's, that's perfectly fine too. What you are seeing here, folks, is something we call the seven sisters. Um, if you want its Latin name, they refer to it as the Pleiades. Let me see if I can get the name Pleiades up here on my main screen. Um, there we go, there's the Pleiades. Now you'll notice another name that you can see up there that looks pretty familiar to you and maybe kind of surprising. Yeah, the name Subaru is up there. You know that car company, right? Well, do you remember on the marquee on the logo of that car company? You'll see six stars on a Subaru. And the reason for that is because that company was formed by the merger of five companies together. And by bringing those five companies together to make one, they were inspired by Japanese mythology and Japanese storytelling and the Japanese sky. They named this group of stars in their culture Subaru, okay? And so that's where you get that logo in the name of that car company. So if you wanna call it the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters or Subaru, all those answers are right. Yeah, they're a great object to look at with binoculars tonight. So I highly recommend this, looking at that when they come up in the East later this evening. Okay, um, but they're also pretty neat to look at, of course, even without binoculars. All right, let's go later. Notice now, I believe, yeah, this is after midnight. Um, we see a couple of objects up here that might look pretty familiar to you. Uh, notice over a little bit north of east, you might be able to see the moon. There's the moon right there. Let me zoom in on it. There we go. You can see the moon is about half lit, um, but the left side is lit up. This is the moon when it's at last quarter, okay? So uh, in the cycle of lunar phases that takes roughly about a month, oh, excuse me, roughly about a month, um, that cycle of phases, we are about three quarters of the way through that cycle. So the moon had started off being right next to the sun, then it went a quarter of the way through, you saw the right half of the moon, then the moon was full, and then now, after three weeks, we see now that the moon is only half full, but on this side. So you're only seeing the moon late at night, and maybe you see the moon in the morning pretty high up. This morning when I was driving to work, I saw the moon really high up in the south, a um, little bit after sunrise. So you might catch it then too. You don't have to be up all night just to look for the moon. The moon actually happens to be currently in the constellation known as Gemini, by the way. Uh, you've heard of the twins, right? Well, there you can see the twins there. Uh, their names of the twins are actually Castor. Oh, they're not lit up. Never mind. Their names are Castor and Pollux. And yes, I know I said them wrong, but I always say Castor first. I, I just, I guess I'm alphabetical that way. All right. Let's see here. Now, there's a really famous constellation just to the right of that. You can probably recognize it from these three bright stars. And then there's a couple of other bright stars up there as well. This is the constellation known as Orion, okay? Uh, Orion's probably the most famous constellation. Those of you who saw a bunch of movies back in the 1980s, you might remember Orion pictures. They would always show these bright stars in Orion at that time as well. Um, a couple of the stars in this constellation might be familiar to you. Uh, too. Uh, the one over here on the lower right, that one is called Rigel right there. Um, I believe if you're looking for an obscure Harry Potter reference, I think Rigel was, um, was the name of one of Sirius Black's relatives. Um, was that his brother, maybe? Yeah. Um, and then this star on the upper left here, you might be bothered if I say the name Betelgeuse three times, okay? So yeah, they got the name of that in film from this star here. They obviously spelled it differently so that you could properly pronounce it. But yeah, it's pronounced Betelgeuse. Oh, you said it twice. Watch out. Okay. Let's see here. We'll go even later into the night. This is after 1 a.m. right now. Let's see what else comes up over here in the east. Well, there's a really bright star over there just below Orion. Let me hit that one. 
If you follow Orion's belt down here, you see a really bright star in the southeast. That star is another Harry Potter reference. The one you're looking at here is actually called Sirius. And you remember, if you watched those movies or read those books, Sirius was able to turn himself into a dog. Sirius is nicknamed the Dog Star, right? Okay. Ah, Regulus Arcturus Black. Thanks for looking that up, Kathy. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, my bad. Um, that's all right. Anyways, so Sirius is the Dog Star, and that is because the constellation that Sirius is in. Oh, I thought I was able to get that up there. There we go. There you can see a little dog is the constellation known as Canis Major. And you can see the doggy right there too. Um, we actually have another dog constellation, Canis Minor, uh, but this one's probably not as spectacular. Watch this. It's right over there. Basically, you are looking at two stars forming a little dog. Um, I believe in the planetarium, we actually have a little hot dog image that we put up there as a joke and it always gets a good laugh. Um, but for now, you just have to imagine it's funny. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and go a little bit later into the night now. Ooh, that's something really bright coming up over there. Okay. That thing that's over in the east, I believe this will be the brightest thing you can see in the night sky aside from the moon. And I actually saw a meteor just now. The software simulated a meteor while I was talking there. Um, but you might not have seen it considering how... Uh, how much this feed gets over to you all. Right here should be the planet Venus. Let me see if I got that right. Yes, there, there's the planet Venus coming up and this is at about 5 a.m. Okay, so it's coming up uh, over here uh, just before dawn. Um, now, Venus goes by a couple of other names. You might have heard to it referred as the morning star or maybe you've heard it referred to as the evening star. Right now, Venus is going to be called the morning star because once the sun starts to come back up and we get that twilight in the sky, you will start to lose the light from all those other stars because of all that sunlight. But the last thing you will see before the sun comes up, aside from the moon, will be Venus. That's where it gets its name from because it's the first star. And look, if you can't see me in my camera, I'm putting up my quotation marks. It's the first star you see in the evening or the last star you see in the morning, okay? Honestly, I'm totally fine with that nickname, calling it a evening star or a morning star, because it was not until the work of those Renaissance astronomers that we understood that these planets were fundamentally different from the other stars. The term planet actually comes from meaning wandering star. When you look at the stars from night to night, you actually see them change their positions relative to the other stars. Watch how Venus is gonna move from one night to the next. You see that there? You see Venus is moving uh, compared to the other stars there. All right, so let's go ahead and I'll go up to about 6.30 now. There, we're now losing most of our sky. And the other fun thing to think about with this in the sky after 6 a.m is that now you actually see Mars is way low in the west and you see Venus is pretty high up over here in the east. So those two very bright planets are actually kind of bookending our sky right before dawn in the mornings at this moment. Jupiter and Saturn have set long ago by this point, but we do at least have a few planets up at every time of the night. Okay, so let's go ahead and we will now uh, let the sky get brighter and brighter, watch our stars and also our planets disappear. The only thing that'll be left when the sun gets up will be the moon. The stars are being a little bit more persistent than usual because I made them brighter. But eventually Venus will disappear even too. Yeah, now Venus is gone, and you can now see that the sun is up right there. And you can see the moon is kind of like pointing at it, almost like a little arrow showing you where the sun is based off of how it's reflecting all that sunlight. All right, folks, I believe the time on here, yeah, it's about 7.35, about 12 hours from now. Wow, you've been with me for 12 hours. You were up all night watching this whole sky. Do you feel tired? 
well, you know, if you still have got some energy, feel free to step out and go stargazing with uh, a little bit of the assistance that I've offered you now. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, um, but I can bring it up back again at any time. Uh, do you folks have any questions that you wanted to ask to Waylena or me? You can ask in the chat or you can unmute and ask that way. Absolutely. Well, if not, we want to tell you about uh, we have coming up Kaler Lectures, the Kaler Lecture Series. We'll have the next lecture on the uh, uh, first Friday of the next month. And what is that topic going to be, Eric? It's going to be about uh, advancements in designing nuclear reactors. Nice. And then yeah. uh, afterwards, we are um, uh, going to have a special live program where we're going to uh, be talking about space junk, um, things that are left over from space missions. Now, last time we talked about Mars. And the reason I thought of that is because I see Barbara's question about when will the rover land on Mars? And yes, Perseverance is the rover. And that's going to be in February. And uh, I think it's the, is it the 18th, Eric, off the top of my head? I think that's the, the date, but I could be wrong on the date. But it's going to be in the middle of the afternoon, oh, like 2.30 in the afternoon, our time. And so we will definitely be having some sort of event uh, for that. I'll probably have to be online, but uh, still, uh, we'll be celebrating that. And uh, it'll take some time before they're able to... Um, start using the helicopter and the name of the helicopter is Ingenuity. So that's going to be some exciting stuff. Oh, we have another question, Eric. Yeah, I'm getting to it. I'm going to probably share my screen one more time here so that you can see Saturn up close. Yeah. Um, so this is a great question, Kirsten. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so that I can help answer this question about Saturn's rings. Um, Thanks to the missions that we've sent to Saturn to look at the rings up close, we have a pretty good understanding of how these rings behave. Uh, let me get that there. So notice when you look at this image up close, you do see two very bright rings there, but those rings are kind of a ring complex because each of those main rings have thousands of smaller little rings in there. Okay. They're all separated by certain amounts. Um, so yeah, we usually do say that they are separated. The name of that dark gap between those two main rings, they actually call that the Cassini division, named after this Italian astronomer who first saw it back in the 1600s. But there are names of other little gaps. You see that outer ring actually has a tiny little gap in it that you can see too. That one's called the Anki gap, Anka gap right there. Um, and the reason why Saturn has all of these separate rings right there is because, again, they're just made out of bits of ice. And that ice can be nudged around by many factors. One possible factor is if you've got a tiny little moon or a moonlet flying through the rings, clearing out material, pushing it out of the way, kind of just sweeping through there like you do with your snowblower on certain days. Um, uh, another way is that if you've got one of the moons orbiting around Saturn and it nudges that material with its gravitational pull, it can pull material out of those rings. And the Cassini division is actually being nudged, the, the ring material particles in that Cassini division are, is being nudged by one of Saturn's larger moons. It's called Minus, okay? Um, now that's not to say that the Cassini division is completely empty. It's not devoid of material. It's just that it's far less concentrated, okay? Was that an overly detailed answer you were looking for? What makes Mars orange? Great question uh, from the five-year-old member of the Smith family. Um, whoops, say goodbye to Saturn there. Let's go ahead and click on Mars and see what we can get. It's gonna pop in really suddenly. Okay, so- you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I can actually yeah. see your canyon. Thanks for the reminder. I love forgetting to do that. It's it's like clockwork. It has to happen at least once each night. All right. So 
Um, the thing that I had marveled at in the picture I was looking at here, do you see what looks like a little scar up there at the top? That's the humongous canyon that's on Mars. That's called Vallis Marineris right there. And to give you a sense of the size scale, that canyon is as wide as uh, the uh, part as the uh, distance in the U.S. from Los Angeles to New York. Okay, basically from coast to coast, that's how wide that canyon is. So the Grand Canyon is truly grand, but it ain't the grandest canyon. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get at there. So to answer your question, why is Mars orange? Um, generally, it is based off of the chemical composition of the surface. Um, think about what colors can give you a ruddy sense of color here on Earth. Oftentimes, that's from things like rust, iron oxides, and that is the main reason where Mars gets that color from, okay? So it's just a nasty, rusty surface that's been blowing around. Um, and it's a very dry world too, okay? So since you don't have the oceans covering up any portion of it whatsoever because it's so cold there and the atmosphere is so thin, um, all you see is this dry, rusty, covered surface. That's a great question, Michael, and a great question from your seven-year-old child there. Um, the red, how, how long would the uh, great red spot last on Jupiter? Astronomers would love to know that answer, because I don't. Wait, Lena, do you know that answer? Exactly. She's throwing no, up her hands. But it's right an here. incredibly wonderful question. Yeah, yeah. We really don't know. <laughs> she said, you rust. Cool. That's great. Um, but yeah, it's been persistent. There, remember that hurricanes are persistent here on Earth when they get a heat source to supply them with that heat. And they get that heat source from the warm oceans, right? And hurricanes on Earth dissipate as soon as they go over land because they're no longer being fed that heat from the oceans, okay? Well, on Jupiter, there's no land for it to pass over. So the heat source that's supplying that storm is still supplying that storm. So we don't know when it's gonna stop. Um, it's, we don't know how it started either, honestly. Uh, if it was maybe just from random chaos that happens in Jupiter's atmosphere, there's been hypotheses, and I'm not saying I actually support this. Um, there's been hypotheses that uh, storms could have formed on Jupiter based off of impacts. When something actually hits the atmosphere, maybe that causes enough turbulence that forms a storm. And of course, there's a lot of heat in an impact, right? Kaboom! So that could have been something. But that wouldn't be a persistent source of heat, so there's, there's that issue too. Like I said, it's hard for us to know because even though we've looked at that storm for a long time, we haven't actually probed inside of it. Um, Great question from Barbara or from Barbara's family about where the rover Perseverance will land on that planet. Um, I'm trying did to get we say the, that the name of the crater was. Oh, sorry. It's uh, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, though. Yezero, right? Yes, Yezero. I thought it was Yezero. Yezero. Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, it was okay. Yeah, spelled J-E-Z-E-R-O. I have the area on, I can share my share a screen over here. I've got a worldwide telescope up with Mars. Um, don't have the labels on it though, but I can, I can share the screen. See if this will work. Take your time, go for it. Okay. Are you oh, seeing, that looks beautiful. You see Mars. Yeah, Wilina right now is using another piece of open source software, one that you can download and install on your own computer. So you could play around with the very same software she's using. Um, and as you can see, the name is Worldwide Telescope. And I could, I could be, I could be off on this, but I practiced last week going into the area. I'm gonna zoom out again. I've got. Uh, I have my assistant here. Does that look like the right spot, the right area? Oh, now he's saying he doesn't remember either. Um, yeah, he's gonna look it up to confirm it though. It's in one of these uh, uh, dark areas 
but it's off to the edge where the crater is. And I don't think I have a, a, a searchable data set on here for this one, but I do believe it's in here. In this area where based off of the map that I'm seeing, that's looking pretty good. Yeah, it's it's um if you go a little bit yeah, go just a little bit up, I think. Um oh, it's not bad at all right there. This is a different uh, texture map than I'm used to in our planetarium software. Yeah. It does have sensors so that when it lands, they will be able to uh, quickly change course slightly to avoid any, uh, any, any higher obstacles than what they were planning. Let me see if I can stop this share and I have the page for Mars Perseverance uh, open as well. Well, Mars 2020, the, the whole mission. And we'll see if we can Yeah, if you want a web-based way to look for this, folks, um, let me share my screen now. I know we're oh, yes, yes. sharing that one screens. Yes. Um, Google.com, oh, did I just go to Stellarium again? I'm sorry. Uh, Google.com slash Mars will actually take you there too, okay? So they did a Google Maps version of Mars's surface. And, and I admit, I have not found it here yet, um, where is, where is Sirtis Major? <laughs> see if that does it. Ah, okay. Yes. Yep. So, yeah. So, so right up down. here is roughly, yeah. So it should be right up around here is where that crater is. Um, and if you look on the Wikipedia page for it, they kind of pinpointed it based off of this map. The reason these images are so colorful is because the color here is meant to indicate elevation. Okay, so it's it's supposed to be kind of a topographic map in a way. All right, I'll stop sharing because Waylene might have found another way to. Uh, share oh no, that that's no no. Uh, yeah, so my husband Jeff is behind me, and and uh, he's also very much into astronomy and. Uh, um, in fact, we met in the planetarium at the Astronomy Club, the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical uh, group that we uh, mentioned earlier when we saw the observatory used as the backdrop for uh, Eric's Star Talk. And uh, so he was looking up stuff for me. Well, everyone, I hope you will check out the sky. Eric gave us a fantastic tour with a whole bunch of things that we can look for. If you've got binoculars, definitely check the stuff out. Uh, the, the Pleiades, just gorgeous. Uh, you might be able to see the moons of Jupiter. You can hold the binoculars steady enough. To, it, there's so many things that you can check out and we do hope that you will. And we hope you'll join us for future Star Talks. And uh, everyone, I'm going to go ahead. I don't know if you, if you can unmute yourselves or, or what, but I'm going to give Eric a round of applause here. Thank you. That they're, they're waving. Oh, I really you. appreciate thank that. That was a great set of questions. Yes, absolutely. And mm -hmm. for those having we'll have another fall. Go ahead. Oh no, we will have another in two weeks. For those who had technical difficulties, I, I will try to get this up onto YouTube uh, tomorrow so that uh, you'll be able to, to see what you missed. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. We really hope you had a good time. Okay. You're all very welcome. Appreciate the, well, the, uh, the kind words. I didn't even talk about any galaxies. Well, there's something for two weeks from now. 
I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and, and leave so I can go to the other astronomy talk that I'm attending. Have fun with the Drake planets here I am. Thank you. Oh. All right. Chris, it's just you and me. If you had any other questions or requests, I can show some stuff to you. I'm sorry, I was talking to you without the. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm sorry. I